Welcome. Uh, today we will be talking about the concept of the global citizen. My name is Cesar Saraceras. I'm a professor of political science at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, I welcome all of you uh, to the next hour uh, to discuss a very critical and important topic for you. Uh, even though you are in junior high or in high school at this point, under 21, this concept is of serious importance to you, to your community, and to the world at large. Uh, today, uh, we will be talking about the global citizen in terms of four major objectives. Uh, the first is to understand the meaning of globalization. The second is to understand the responsibilities of you as an individual student, responsibilities to the global community and to the improvement of the global community. Thirdly, uh, understand some of the major global issues of today, whether it's poverty, whether it's the environment, whether it's war, the war on terrorism, drugs, human trafficking. The important as aspect is that you understand all of these are linked to your own quality of life and your well-being. And lastly, I want you to understand your future. Uh, your future in terms of your education, uh, your future in terms of your opportunities to make a difference in the 21st century. Think of yourself as having a goal of reaching the year 2050. The question becomes, what kind of education do you want? And what kind of career opportunities will you have? And how many opportunities will you have to make things better for others? The global citizen of the 21st century, as you see on the slide, has various questions to ask. And they include what are the unique responsibilities that I have, that you have, as a member of American society. It is a unique history. It is a unique society with enormous responsibilities as well as enormous powers to do well and not to do so well in terms of others. What do you need to know about what's happening globally? Things are happening. You are part of the rest of the world without even making that decision. The rest of the world has come to us, and we need to understand that and appreciate the responsibilities that it brings us. And lastly, what educational goals do you need to pursue into the future? You will be graduating from high school in a few years. What's next? A university education? A professional education? What kind of career will you have to manage and improve yourself and for the well-being of your family and your own community? Here are some questions that I would ask you to consider as you think about preparing for your own future. Beyond the formal education that you must secure, high school degree, college degree, a professional degree, uh, what kind of knowledge, what kind of experience, what kind of skills do you need to acquire? Secondly, what will education do for your future? What kind of future do you imagine for yourself and where will education fit into that? Skills, language skills, computer skills, math skills, a variety of skills will be important to your future. Remember, you're preparing yourself for the first half of the 21st century. Nearly 40 years. How will the world change? How will you change? And what kinds of opportunities do you want to present to yourself? And lastly, how can you plan for a lifetime of opportunities? Remember, the goal is 2050, first half of the 21st century. Here's a timeline that you will have a few minutes to fill out today in class. And it's going to ask you certain questions that you can hopefully fill out very quickly. But the idea of this time frame is to give you an idea of what, how time will go in the direction of the 2050 period. How old will you be? What will be the opportunities? So please fill it out and then we can discuss it in terms of its meaning. As I put out at the very bottom of this time quiz, you too know people in their 60s. And you'll be in your 60s in the year 2050. How old are your grandparents today? That's how old you will be. And the question is, are you prepared for the year 2050? The Global Citizen Quiz is meant to discuss the context of the United States within the global arena. As you discuss these answers, you'll begin to understand the importance of the United States in terms of the global community. Its wealth, its power, creates responsibilities to do well, to do good, and to have its citizens like you be in the front runner of making changes that are for the better. As you fill out the quiz, you'll have a better appreciation of what America is, 
what America should be, and how America impacts the rest of the world. Question I have for you today to begin with, why should you care about the rest of the world? And if I were to ask two questions to start off this discussion, I would say, identify two reasons why we should care about what happens beyond our shores, beyond our land-based uh, borders. Why should we care what happens in the Amazon basin? Why should we care about what happens in Afghanistan? Why should we care what's going on in Brazil, in China, et cetera? Core questions. What's globalization? How does it affect the United States, California, your community, and you as an individual? Why does it matter that we understand the processes and consequences of globalization? Defining globalization is not easy but we can look at the perspective of the social sciences. And the social sciences is best describes globalization in the following way. Professor Robert Cohane, a well-known political scientist, has described globalization in the following way. And I'll just read one of them, you can read the other two. But if you look at the, the first quote, as a result of technological and societal change, human activities across regions and continents are increasingly being linked together. In other words, the big planet is getting smaller every year. At the same time, the number of global issues are on the rise and of consequence to the United States, to its well-being, to its health, to its security. And these are the things that we need to understand as we look at the definition of globalization. I will give you a chance to read the other two links uh, for discussion. Despite the complexity of defining globalization, I would like for you to think in terms of the three C's. The three C's constitute connections, competition, and cooperation. And what that means is very simple. Globalization increasingly connects all of us, all countries, all issues. So it's a connecting process that did not exist 20, 30 years ago. What happens 10,000 miles away from the United States has consequences for America, for its society. Competition, the second C. Globalization has created competition among the economies, has created competition among educational sectors. The opportunities breed competition. And we have to understand that as we graduate from high school, as we graduate from college, Many of us will be in competition with others somewhere else in the world. And thirdly, the third C is cooperation. As we deal with globalization, as we deal with the world getting smaller, but as we deal with global issues on the rise, there's only one way to solve most of these problems, and they are not necessarily found in the United States. Countries must work with each other. Global negotiations on environment, on AIDS, on trade, are essential to the well-being of the global community. Because if the well-being of the global community is not an objective, then the well-being of the United States is under duress and uncertain. Now let's look at a couple of images of what globalization constitutes for you to understand the importance. And in the future, of this, during this Global Connect program, you may have an opportunity to work uh, on joint projects in one of these areas. So we can look at the first image. The world in 2009, our new president, Barack Obama, on the global agenda. Humongous, travel worldwide already, talking to other countries, talking to world leaders, negotiating a variety of issues, whether it's trade, whether it's peace, whether it's the environment, whether it's space. These are essential elements of the global agenda for the United States and for our own particular president, Barack Obama. Terrorism became an important issue during the 9-11 period, that is September 9th, 2001. The attack in New York, the attack in Washington, D.C. against the Pentagon began a new era in our concerns about terrorists, about terrorism. It overlapped a military involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq, two military involvements that continue to this very day. But it also created other issues about protecting our borders, protecting our, our well-being and, and protecting our sovereignty. Terrorism has affected the way we look at borders, the way we look at immigration, the way we look at trade. So as you look at terrorism, you also need to look at the whole question of how does security apply to every facet of life 
in terms of relationships between the international, within the international community. The world economy. Globalization is about having a global economy. That is, national economies that are linked to each other. The global economy now is central to globalization. Trade, the flow of money, the flow of multi-million number of containers on container ships. Shipping, the flow of money are critical to the world economy. The recession right now, global recession has affected world trade. But until we recoup the health of world trade, the economies of the world, including that of the United States, uh, will be weak and uncertain. And as long as they're weak and uncertain, then the fragile eco uh, economies and societies of other countries in the world will be at risk. And it is the United States, uh, along with the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, etc., uh, that need to come to the help of these fragile countries. Immigration. Immigration now has become part of the terrorist threat. The United States is one of those countries that acknowledges the need to invite, to encourage immigration to the country, to give it life, to give it some diversity, and it's always been a welcoming country. Most countries in the world, most of the 200 countries in the world, do not see granting citizenship to foreigners as a function of their society. The United States does. So over a million and a half immigrants come to the United States legally with proper papers. In addition, there's an estimated 12 million individuals in the United States without proper documentation, the undocumented. They are part of our economy, uh, they are part of links to family, and these are issues that we must also address. Immigration remains at the center of what America is. Global public health. You're aware of AIDS, you're aware of avian flu, you're aware of all forms of other influenzas that could become a pandemic, moving from an epidemic to a pandemic of global proportions. We must now be very careful with any type of flu, influenza, that could affect individuals in large groups. We went through one just recently. We may expect another influenza outbreak that could become pandemic uh, in the fall, uh, given the weather and given the availability of drugs to help arrest such a flu bug. Um, global public health is critical to the well-being of over half of the six, seven and a half, seven billion inhabitants of the, of the world today. Public health is expensive, public health is a necessity, and it is an area that you as students need to consider because public health issues 5,000 miles away could eventually become a public health issue in the United States. Poverty. With approximately one-third of the six and a half billion inhabitants of the world considered languishing in poverty, we must be concerned. Poverty produces conflict. Poverty produces refugees. Poverty produces uncertainty among governments. Poverty is primarily at the root of many problems that we need to be aware of and we need to be party to in terms of its solving. Poverty does not help the United States. Poverty is a responsibility for the United States to help resolve along with non-governmental organizations, along with the United Nations, along with the International Monetary Fund. So as you look at other countries, look at the poverty levels, look at what produces poverty, and look at the options, not only for the United States, but for the world community to help alleviate poverty throughout the world. The environment, a hot topic, a well-known topic all over the world. The environment now is challenging the issues of global warming. It is raising the question about the air we breathe. It is questioning the water purity of what we have. And it's not just issues that are somewhere else in the world. We ourselves have environmental challenges. But many of these environmental challenges cannot be resolved in the United States alone. We must work with partner nations to deal with the environment, whether it's the forest, whether it's the water, whether it's the climate change, uh, whatever the issues might be that produces environmental challenges to the United States, it's also a challenge to the rest of the world. This is where cooperation comes in. This environment is probably going to be one of the top three challenges for the next decade. Global communications and technology. You probably all have cell phones. 
You probably have, all have other gadgets, electronic gadgets that didn't exist 10, 20 years ago that your parents didn't grow up with, but that you grow up with. Well, there's a proliferation of, of technology throughout the world. The questions that we must raise with technology is, is it going to help alleviate many of the global issues? Or will it exacerbate? Will the computer, will the cell phone help narrow the gap between rich and poor, between healthy and unhealthy? Or will this technology help separate and increase the gap between? We don't know yet, but we do, what we do know is technology is on the rise. The cell phone is essential for global communication. And we need to understand that the more we talk to people, the more we communicate with people, the better off the situation is going to be. This will help understanding of globalization. But we also have to understand we must find a way to better use technology for solving global issues. The Middle East. We talked about terrorism. We talked about conflict. For the last 50 years, efforts have been made by the United States as well as other countries to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli issue. It remains unresolvable. Nevertheless, it's an important issue to discuss. It affects the United States because of our own demographics, but it also affects us in terms of the potential for conflict in the Middle East, a conflict that will most likely engage us. For now, we are involved in Iraq. We are involved in Afghanistan. Uh, we have allies as well as enemies in the Middle East. So as a regional area, the Middle East probably is the most important region that we must be concerned about and make every effort to help resolve the conflicts between populations and especially find a solution to the millions of refugees uh, without a home uh, and simply living in refugee camps generation after generation. Middle East is something that we must focus on and better understand, both in terms of American interest as well as in terms of global interest. Probably the economy that is, quote unquote, the hottest in the world today is China. Tremendous growth rates, double digit. It's an important debtor for the United States. In other words, the United States borrows a lot of money from China in order to pay its own debts and in order to sustain its own governmental budget. China in many ways is an adversary, but in also in many ways is an ally. And this relationship between an adversary and ally is something that we have to come to understand. China forms uh, one fourth of what is known as BRIC, B-R-I-C. Brazil, India, China, and Russia are seen as the emerging industrial giants of the global economy. Whether this happens or not, we don't know yet. But you must realize that these four countries are seen as part of the future of the globe, of the global economy, and all four countries are of paramount importance to the United States. So remember BRIC, remember Brazil, China, India, and Russia, and this will take you a long way to understanding some of the more important countries for the future in this century. Global culture better known as the Americanization of the world. McDonald's, American movies, American books and magazines, images, dress, clothing, you name it, the global culture is being challenged by the Americanization of society. And that can be good, that can also be a negative for many people who believe that their own society, their own culture, their own language needs to be sustained. Nevertheless, American movies, American clothes, American cars, American everything uh, are items of significance in most countries of the world. And that's something that we need to appreciate and understand and laud. But we also need to understand the resistance to being Americanized. And this is a phenomenon that we need to understand as the process of globalization continues. Global negotiations. If you recall, one of the C's was cooperation. Problems cannot be solved globally without leaders getting together. We have nearly 200 nations that belong to the United Nations. We have 50 to 60 to 70 major international organizations like the UN, like the Organization of American States, like the International Monetary Fund, like WTO, and then six, seven, eight thousand or more NGOs, non-governmental organizations, all trying to solve problems. 
Here are some images of some of the representatives of the world trying to discuss negotiations over trade, over finance, over just agreeing to agree to negotiate the re resolution of certain global issues. So please keep in mind that the world is organized into states, mainly almost 200, organized into international organizations, of which there could be 50 to 70 now, and organized into thousands and thousands of NGOs, private citizens raising public, public and private money to solve specific problems. Let me move very briefly to the NGOs in the global community. These are non-governmental organizations. And while they receive funding from governments and from international organizations, they are largely driven by the mission of individuals, individuals with the goal of helping. It could be on rural education. It could be on women's rights. It could be on cooperatives. Uh, it could be working with children. Uh, it could be a variety of issues that small groups of individuals from across the world, from different countries, uh, different nationalities, different funding levels are able to apply themselves uh, in groups of three or in groups of 300 to resolving specific global issues at the local level. Let me point out one organization uh, that, uh, and one individual that has recently emerged in the media. In this case, it's Haiti and an individual by the name of Aaron. It's the case of Haiti and it's a citizen making a difference. And here's an example for you. Aaron Jackson is a golf caddy from Florida. Never planning to do anything. He was just taking a, uh, a tour of Central America and the, and, and, and the Caribbean. Ended up in Haiti uh, several years ago, namely three years ago. Began to notice children and unhealthy children with inflated stomachs. Found out that they were internal parasites that affect about 40 to 50% of Haiti's children. He found out that for $20, each child could be dewormed permanently in terms of a public health question. He helped organize the Planting Peace NGO and he is in charge of the program called Stomp the Worm Project. Over these last three or four years, a golf caddy from Florida, never thinking about global issues, never thinking about being a humanitarian or an NGO, has been raising millions of dollars to solve the deworming issue among children in Haiti. A remarkable experience, a remarkable case. The message for you is you'll never know when you will get the opportunity at any age to help others. He took advantage of it, he understood the meaning, and he simply did it. Now that's his mission in life. Let me leave you now with several questions that you need to consider for the future. We've already raised these questions, but I just want to remind you very quickly. You need to talk to yourself, you need to talk to your family, you need to talk to your teacher, need to talk to your peers. What kind of formal education do you need in order to go forward? Simple question, difficult answers. But it's going to require some serious thinking and a conscious strategy. What is it that you want to learn? What kinds of skills do you believe are important? And to what extent do you want to be involved as a global citizen? Sometimes you may have no choice. Sometimes it will present to you at the most awkward moment and then it's a choice for you to decide whether you're going to venture into serving others. Uh, the kind of education you get will help shape your future. It won't determine it, but it will help shape, shape your future over the next three to four decades. Third one is skills. Second, third languages, statistical skills, computer skills, health skills. What kind of skills do you want to carry with you? beyond your formal education? What kinds of experiences that will help shape the kind of career that you will eventually uh, take on? And lastly, if you recall our timeline about where you want to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you need to start thinking about the year 2050. You won't rush to it. It'll take you a long time to get there, but it'll be the first half of the 21st century, and you'll be in your late 50s or early 60s. You have grandparents that are that old, if not older. What do you want to do to get there? How do you want to get there? Uh, it may not work out that way, but at least if you think of that magical number 2050, the world will have changed by then significantly. You won't recognize the world. 
So what do you want to do to prepare for it? And what do you want to do to help change the world and make it better uh, for others? As a parting word in terms of your own future, in terms of uh, what the world is waiting for you to do and what you can expect from the rest of the world, you should read this quote by the former U.S. Secretary of Labor. And I'll read it very quickly to you, but you should read it for yourself. We are living in a knowledge-based economy that requires a highly skilled, educated, flexible workforce. It requires workers who continually upgrade their skills over the course of their careers so they can adapt, evolve with changing industries and with changing times. I will end with this slide and for you to take up the challenge. The 21st century will evolve very quickly and you will have to adapt to career innovations. You will also reach that valuative question. How do you balance self-interest, which is appropriate, taking care of yourself, having a good job, taking care of family, with service to others. The service to others is a challenge, but in terms of being a global citizen, it's an essential part of your life. Options on making the world a better place. You may not know what they are, but what's gonna happen is that they'll be presented to you. So you think in terms of the kinds of opportunities you're gonna to have to make the world better for some other people crucial part of your own life. And lastly, as I said before, you in the year 2050, how will you get there? And what is it that you will be able to do once you get there? You'll still have an extraordinary part of your life left. It'll be the year 2050, half of the 21st century. And it will certainly not look like the year 2009, 2010. So with the end of this presentation on The Global Citizen, wish you well, think hard, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy uh, your education and your life much better. Thank you.